The United States of America, at this point in the war 100 years ago today, was neutral. But we've had a bunch of you write in wondering what was going on in the U.S. at the time and how the road to war developed. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War special episode about the United States of America before it joined the war. The years leading up to 1917, when the U.S. joined the war, were a transformative period for the nation and in many ways were when the U.S. became a great power. By 1910, the USA had become the world's leading industrial power and by the war, we have numbers like the U.S. possessing 35.5% of the world's manufacturing capacity compared to 16% for Germany and just under 15% for Britain. And American industry and finance would be important to the war. Still though, most of America's population was rural. Also, a large percentage of the population were either immigrants or the children of immigrants, and they came from all over the world. The largest number were from the British Isles, including Ireland, but Germans were the second largest number. So opinion about the war was pretty split when it broke out. In all, there were 15 million European immigrants in the US, with a million new immigrants arriving from the whole world each year. On August 19th, 1914, President Woodrow Wilson gave a speech officially declaring the United States neutral. But Americans eagerly and actively contributed aid and supplies. And within a year, there were over 100 institutions giving some form of humanitarian aid. And as an example of the scope of some of them, the Belgian Relief Organization contributed 6 million tons of food. But who did the Americans support? And how did American neutrality transform over the years into a declaration of war? Many immigrant communities had their own newspapers and organizations and used their own languages. And there was support for both sides and certainly more for the central powers than one might think today. The German community supported the central powers. The Jewish community did as well, since Austria-Hungary was pretty much the most tolerant country in Europe and Russia was hated for its anti-Jewish pogroms. The Irish, to a large extent, also supported Germany, both being opposed to British interests. However, there was also a large Anglophile elite and crossed bloodlines like Wilson's mother was British while Winston Churchill's was American, for example. But the U.S. had historically steered clear of foreign entanglements, and the only war with a European power in generations had been the Spanish-American War of 1898, which had not been widely supported popularly. And anyhow, the U.S., in 1914, only had an army of 130,000 regulars and 70,000 National Guardsmen. General Peyton March pointed out that this was barely enough to police domestic emergencies. But America's role in the early stages of the war was immediate, and not surprisingly, it was economic. Certainly, selling munitions was profitable. Heck, by October 1914, the British had already ordered 400,000 rifles. Munitions and war material exports would rise from $40 million in 1914 to $1.29 billion two years later. The U.S. also became the Allies' banker and, though neutral, would lend over $2 billion to the Allies, but only $27 million to the Central Powers. One U.S. congressman described America as the arch-hypocrite among nations, praying for peace while furnishing the instruments of murder to one side only. But why was that, since initially there was a great deal of German sentiment? Why choose to ally with Britain? Well, there were several reasons. There was the constitutional and language similarity, of course. Also, Germany's transatlantic communications cables had been cut, so American reporters routed everything through London, and only things favorable to Britain passed the censors. Parliament had passed the Defense of the Realm Act that gave censors power to scrutinize every word that went from Britain to America, and German atrocities were hyped. Episodes such as the rape of Belgium and the execution of Edith Cavill provoked great outrage as they were reported by the giants of yellow journalism, Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst. The central powers could not possibly keep up from a PR standpoint. And if those things were big deals, Think how big the sinking of the liners Lusitania and Arabic by German submarines were to the American public with the loss of American civilian lives. In fact, the only media that time and again spoke out against the war and wished to keep America out of it was the socialist press and the German press, and their reach was limited, even though there were around 500 German language newspapers in the States. Their combined circulation was well under 2 million. 
To look at the slide to war, you have to look at President Wilson and how his views changed between 1914 and 1917. Now, as president, Wilson is also commander-in-chief of the armed forces, and though it falls to Congress to declare war, Congress was in session for only three months between the outbreak of the war and the end of 1915. Yep, three months. The Congress elected in November 1914 wouldn't convene till December 1915, so Wilson acted on his own, and he was, by his own admission, new to foreign policy. He said this when he was elected in 1912, it would be an irony of fate if my administration had to deal with foreign problems, for all my preparation has been in domestic matters. His concerns were more moral than strategic, and initially, he saw himself as a mediator, and even in December 1914, he emphasized that the U.S. had never had, and would never have, a standing army. Former President Teddy Roosevelt blasted Wilson for abject cowardice and said Wilson was willing to sacrifice the honor and interest of the country to his own political advancement. Roosevelt wrote a book promoting American intervention and even said the U.S. ran the risk of becoming another Belgium. But the campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare that resulted in the sinking of the Lusitania and the Arabic, and Wilson's friend and personal advisor Edward House, a big influence on Wilson who urged him to support Britain, and new Secretary of State Robert Lansing, who did the same, began to really change Wilson's mind about intervention. In his December 1915 State of the Union address, Wilson presented plans for building up the armed forces, and in May 1916 passed the National Defense Act, which doubled the Army and the Naval Appropriations Act, aimed to create a world-class Navy. In early 1916, he kicked off his President's Preparedness Campaign with a series of speeches saying that the U.S. might well be drawn into the conflict and must prepare for it. Like it or not, if he didn't, the presidential election of 1916 would have the war as its central issue. Wilson won a narrow victory. As 1917 began, the Germans once again began a campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare, and American citizens died as a result. When the Russian Revolution toppled the Tsar, one of the major contradictions for Allied claims that they were fighting for democracy was removed. But as late as March 19th, Wilson still felt like this about going to war. It would mean we should lose our heads and stop weighing right and wrong. Once lead people into this war and they'll forget there ever was such a thing as tolerance. To fight, you must be brutal and ruthless, and the spirit of ruthless brutality will enter into the very fiber of our national life. If there is any alternative, for God's sake, let's take it. Less than a month later, Woodrow Wilson asked Congress for a declaration of war on Germany. Now this was a brief and general rundown, and I encourage you all to look up the specifics yourself to get a clearer idea of what was at play. I'm going to end this episode with another quote, this one from The Origins of World War I. It is true that great forces of geopolitics, strategy, culture, and economics shape the context in which Wilson made his decision. It is true that the opinions of others counted in his decision. Wilson's decision to intervene was a close, risky thing, a calculation of costs and benefits, and a reflection on the human condition that could easily have taken him in a different direction. In the end, his decision was the crucial factor. He, and he alone, took the United States into World War I. Today, the service of veterans is sometimes forgotten. That's why we're giving a shout out to the United States World War I Centennial Commission and their important work for the Remembrance of Veterans Day. Check out the links in the description below to find out how you can help your veterans. We'd like to thank Madeline Johnson for doing the bulk of the research for this special. Thanks, Madeline. She also helped us with the art special and the Italy special. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the sinking of the Lusitania and the uproar it caused, you can check out our episode about that right here. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. See you next time.